on his computer. And so thank you to everyone who's coming in and already here for making time. This is our first WCCI Wednesday conversation and we're excited. Um, just to give you a little bit of orientation for today, um, we're gonna be talking about with the leadership team of WCCI about how we got into this work and why we continue in it and then how has COVID changed what we're doing personally and professionally and um, if we have time, some coping skills that we're using to manage the challenges of being in COVID times. So um, we're gonna get started. We have about 10, well, first of all, um, we are, we're recording this, um, this session and we're gonna put it on the WCCI website. So if some reason you're not comfortable with that, that's totally fine and you're welcome not to be part of the session if you choose not to. The other thing is we're asking everyone to be on mute. And if you have any questions to put them in the chat box, we're not sure how many people are gonna come it's just easier to manage. And so Candace is gonna be watching the chat box for us. And so um, if you have anything to say, comment on or ask, you're welcome to put that in the chat box. So when I was thinking about getting ready for this today, I was trying to think back on our timeline and it has only been three years since our first um, conference and then our first official meeting of WCCI in August of 2017. So sometimes I think some of us feel like we should be further along, but it, we've done an extraordinary amount in three years. So um, that was interesting to be able to remember that. So three years since forming WCCI. And so we have 10 people on the leadership team and I've asked them to join us today. Most of them are here to talk about how they got into um, the work of WCCI and why they continue to do it. You've heard the phrase, what's your why? And so I kind of wanted us to kick these off with sort of some reminders about why we do this work. And so I'm just gonna go in order of people I see on the list. Um, and so leadership team, if you'll know it pretty soon, I'm gonna be calling your name and just have your finger near that unmute button. But Adam, you're, it looks like we're alphabetical by first name. So Adam um, Hagee is on leadership team. He is one of the co-chairs for the data committee. And so Adam, I'm watching your thing to see if you unmute. There you are. So Adam, um, good afternoon. I hope you're well. Doing well. I hope you all are doing well. Um, good, it's thanks. Good to, it's good to, good to be with you all. Um, so uh kind of why i got involved with um uh the initiative is due to my relationship here at app state with kelly reed ashcraft um she's a social work professor here and we were connected on a couple of committees and she told me about all of this great work being done in the community and she could tell quickly that i was passionate about uh community work uh community engagement um i quickly gathered some insight into what the initiative was uh, focused on. And I have a passion for uh, social justice issues and, and social determinants of health and, and really understanding how um, adverse childhood experiences really kind of play a large role in, in those and how social determinants of health really uh, help to uh, play a role in driving adverse childhood experiences and it has huge uh, public health implications. So that's why I'm here and I, I get excited just about being engaged with such a great group of people that, that want to help others and, and see our community try to improve each day. All right, Adam, thank you. We appreciate that. Um, Candace, you're next on the list. If you can unmute yourself and tell us a little bit about how you got involved with WCCI and why you continue to do um, work with them. Hi everybody, um, Candace Walker here. I serve as the prevention counselor for Watauga County Schools. My training is as a special educator at first and a school counselor later. Um, and I had a role switch from being a standard school counselor to prevention counselor the same year that this movement was born in Watauga County. I just happened to be able to have the flexibility to get involved with the first conference, the State of the Child Conference. 
and could see how that related to my work as an educator and specifically how it related to my work in prevention. Um, the work that I'm to be doing is specifically prevention of drug and alcohol and tobacco use. Um, and as I learned more about trauma and ACEs and adversity, I, it just made a lot of sense to me that whenever we learn skills to help us to be resilient and to manage our stuff, um, we don't turn to things that are unhealthy, like all those things that I'm trying to prevent our students from taking up. So that's my where and how, and I keep doing it because I think it makes sense. And as we expand this work into the school system and um, continue to work and train with school faculties in all nine of our schools in Watauga County, um, being able to help teachers and students and families understand adversity and resiliency makes life better for everybody. I've been so thankful in the past six months that we had already laid a foundation in the school system in this work um, because definitely COVID is traumatic for everybody and all these changes that we've been forced into. Um, it's been important for us to have some resiliency skills to be able to fall back on. All right, Candace, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm seeing somebody in the waiting room and I, okay. I didn't mean to have a waiting room, but there it is. Um, Candace, thank you. I appreciate you adding who you are and what your role is. I forgot to ask people to do that. So um, next, Graham, if you are where you can unmute yourself, I'm gonna ask you to tell us your role in the community and what, how you serve in WCCI and how you got involved and why you continue to do the work. Yeah, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. I guess we're in the afternoon now. My name is Graham. Like Denise said, I'm one of the pastors at the Heart Church in downtown. Our offices are downtown. And I guess I initially got involved in the work of WCCI because Denise Presnell's name was on a short list of people that the staff here were like, you have to connect with them right off the bat when I first started working here. So I met Denise, I think in the office that you're in now, is that right? I think so. <laughs> so we met there and, and quickly, um, yeah, just had a great rapport and talked about a lot of different things. And it kind of came up that I had done some trauma programming stuff in previous roles. And so we got excited about that. And before I knew it, I was part of the WCCI meetings and initiative. And then a little while after that, got to be a part of the leadership team as well. And to help specifically with our awareness committee and some of the, the awareness efforts within the community. So it's been such a gift. I, I think one of the things that excites me the most is how much we talk about resiliency. Candace mentioned that as well. We're just so focused on, yes, ACES and all that that study and others like it highlight and the needs that that presents within our own lives and the lives of our community, but even more so on the fact that there's a lot of strengths here as well. There's a lot of opportunity for resiliency. We're, we're even talking now about some statewide and nationwide initiatives and policies and all that kind of thing. And, and that's so exciting to me because no matter where you're coming from, there's all kinds of space for growth and, and moving forward. And so we're, we're in that together. So it's, it's great to be a part of. Thank you, Graham. Yeah, that reminds me way back in the beginning of this, our beginning three years ago, I can't even remember who it was, but they said, please don't talk about trauma without talking about resiliency because people need to know that healing and growth can happen. And so it's one of the things that we've all kind of said is important to us is to mention both. And yeah, I like that. I think if I can just mention one other thing along that same line, for me in particular, working in the church context, it's so important to bring the faith community into this conversation because so many struggles or issues of trauma or whatever come up in that context. And we haven't historically always been the best equipped to, to handle it well. And so to see some of those partnerships forming as well has been really incredible. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Graham. Jennifer, are you where you can unmute and tell us a little bit about your role in the community and what uh, role you occupy at WCCI and how you got into this and why you keep doing it? Sure, sounds good. Um, that's probably a bigger list than I'll ever remember, but we'll see what comes out of my mouth. I can give you prompts as we go. <laughs> yeah. 
I am Jennifer Warren. I'm the Executive Director of the Western Youth Network. And uh, I was just thinking I have been involved in this work for a little too close to 20 years for my comfort. And so uh, I will be with Win 18 years in September. And so I got into this work before I realized I was getting into this work. And so I think I discovered ACEs and like most of us, um, you know, it's kind of like that lightning bolt moment of this makes so much sense now. And so that was around the 09 time when I kind of read a brief article about it, 2015 when I got more well steeped in it. And then, uh, yeah, Denise took the idea and ran from it, uh, ran with it from there. And, you know, I feel like my why, I tend to be a root cause person, you know, it's like I find myself constantly kind of asking, but why, but why, but why? And so I think that, you know, this work is so refreshing in the sense that there is a why. Like, I feel like I've kind of gone up to the top of the stream with this work and I'm figuring it out. And then I don't like there is a formula for how we solve these community issues, which is so empowering. And so it just keeps me going. And I feel like we truly will see um, relief for humanity and generations to come. And we will really change people's lives if we keep up with this work. And so it's so what keeps me motivated, you know, similar to what Graham was saying, there's just endless possibilities of how we can be a part of the solution. And so that's very motivating for me. Awesome, Jennifer, thank you for sharing. And I don't think you mentioned it, but um, do you mind to tell them what committee that you chair? Sure, I'm on the policy committee. Thank you. Okay, um, let me, I'm looking at chat, we're good. Steph, are you where you can unmute and tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, sure, yep, so can you all hear me okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. So I'm Steph Thomas. Um, I work with the Prevention Committee with WCCI, and then I also work with um, South Mountain and the Children's Advocacy Center of the Blue Ridge out in Fosco as the family advocate there. And um, I think I got, I started to get involved with trauma work probably about three years ago. Um, a little over three years ago, I knew not very much at all about trauma and resiliency. And I really, I, I didn't know anything at all about the ACEs study. Um, at that time, I was working out in Ash and Allegheny as an intensive in-home counselor, um, kind of working with kids, um, doing a lot of in-home sessions. And for a lot of those kids, it was kind of their, um, kind of like that last chance to keep them in the home and treat them there before it got worse and went into something like out of home placement and residential treatment. And um, I ended up, I'd been working, doing that role for about seven years, and I ended up applying for the job here when I heard about it and ended up getting the job. And as part of the training, I went to Lake Junaluska to a child abuse conference. And it was during that opening, kind of that listening to the keynote speaker in that opening that she started talking about ACEs, started talking about trauma and resiliency, what trauma does to the brain, um, how loving supportive caregivers can help kids recover from that and I think that was my oh my god how did I not know about this sooner especially working with kids for so long and so that was really a moment that had a huge impact on me and then shortly after I got to come over here to Fosco and um, through Holly Sink who I work with I was able to get connected with WCCI and I'm just super happy to be here ever since. Awesome thanks Steph. Thank you. Susie, are you where you can unmute? Hey, Denise and group uh, and everybody who winds up listening. Um, I think I'm the elder of the group here and my path into where I am now is way too long and complex to go into much detail, but I first was dealing with the resiliency component of this in the, the late 70s. I was working with um, women's health advocacy and um, ed education empowerment um, back in the old days of Boston Women's Health Collective and all that kind of stuff. I was in the Triangle area of North Carolina and um, we were starting um, educational programs for women with women that were very wellness oriented and, and that were very much about maintaining our own health and, and kind of taking control of that back because the medical establishment was really not doing a very good job with that. And that overlapped a lot with 
substance abuse prevention at the time that I wound up getting hired um, to work with substance abuse prevention and um, as a, a primary prevention, which the research at that time out of NIDA, which was great, it, it backslid after that because of politics, but at that time was really great. It was very solid about saying that people were more likely to be at risk of getting into trouble with alcohol or other drugs when they weren't connected or when they weren't connected well or when they didn't have a good sense of how to navigate life for themselves. So there was that area that was then called life skills. We didn't have the term resiliency as kind of a thing then, but that's basically what we were talking about. And we were working with a huge bunch of um, different kinds of groups and organizations in the communities that we served. We were doing programs in churches and in schools and teacher training and medical professionals and just general community groups, you know, Kiwanis, whatever, whoever would have us come in, youth organizations. But we were doing like several session series of programs on helping folks develop skills for emotional management, for feeling um, stronger within yourself, for improving self-concept and self-confidence, for how to communicate in healthy ways and resolve problems more effectively, all those sort of basic navigating life skills. And as we were doing that, and because we would do a bunch of sessions, we almost never did anything less than like four to six sessions with the group and sometimes much longer. Um, so we get to know participants and what would begin to come out as we did these programs and a lot of experiential activities, role plays and then activities that would be sort of symbolic or metaphorical for relationship dynamics and that sort of thing. Um, we kept hearing about what got in the way of people being able to do that. And sometimes it would be like, oh my gosh, I've never heard this language before. I've never found a way to do that before. And that certainly tied in with my history of not ever having words for, for emotions or any of this kind of stuff out of my family. But it was also, it was like, it was great for the folks who were like, this is amazing. I've never known how to do this before. I've never had words for this before. And talking about how what we were doing really was life-changing for a lot of people, but then also hearing about people coming out of painful situations that were bigger than what we could get into. Um, when I moved up here at the end of 1980, it was for a job at New River Behavioral Health, New River Mental Health Center at the time, and they hired me to do more of that community-wide primary prevention work, life skills and all that with, again, all different kinds of groups and organizations and kids to older people in, in a variety of formats. and. Um, then the money was running out for prevention, so I got my um, master's in health psychology, which is kind of the most wellness-oriented of the, the psychotherapy kinds of degrees, and then transitioned into doing clinical work, and it was right at the time when the whole idea of therapeutic modalities for trauma was beginning to emerge, and the the prevalence of trauma in people's lives, and particularly childhood trauma, was just beginning to, it, it sounds crazy now, but for clinicians, for professionals, it used to be thought of as, well, that's a West Coast problem, or that's a big city, New York City kind of problem. Thank goodness we don't have so much of that here. We know there is child abuse, but we, we really had a lot of blind spots because the systems just weren't in place for education and reporting and, you know, figuring out, even knowing what to do if somebody did report. So that was starting to emerge just barely, and um, my husband got a job at Grandfather Home for Children, which specialized in good. How are you? Wor working with, um, yes, with, highly, you good. Oops, with highly traumatized kids. Oh. Somebody needs to mute their phone, I think. Oh, that'll be um, fun. 
That'll be interesting to promote, won't it? It's Candace. Uh, Candace. Yes, we, Candace. <laughs> Candace, can you mute? Can you. <laughs> that guy, so. I texted her too, hopefully. Okay. Um, so anyway, I then, right as I was beginning to do more clinical work, then Tom was getting sent to a lot of those trainings on dealing with childhood trauma. And the mental health center had a budget to send me as well. And so I got in on some of the earliest training in that therapeutic work, which was the best anybody knew how to do then, because nobody else here had any expertise in that area. It was so new. And so I just thought, well, I was hearing about it from him. Somebody needs to do that at the mental health center. And my director said, sure, go. So I went. And then all of a sudden, I was getting all the referrals for all these people that were starting to um, come in with those those histories. So I, I was just kind of thrown into the deep end of the pool with that and got a lot of professional support from outside of the area. And then in the middle of that process, my husband wound up discovering that he also had a, a big trauma history of his own from his own childhood that he'd been amnesic about. So that really shoved me into, you know, really learning a lot more about that. So I wound up with this strong background in resiliency, but also really uh, diving into some of the, the most heavy duty trauma history therapy and, you know, the best learn, trying to learn, scramble to learn what I could. And then that's just evolved over time. I've continued to have a foot in both worlds, still very passionate about learning what we can do for resiliency, using that as part of my therapy with my clients, but also in the community as well, trying to minimize, uh, reduce the, the problems that do wind up showing up in therapeutic work later. So, and you and I are going to be talking um, just the two of us later mm -hmm. on in a conversation. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to hear some more about that. Um, so thank you for sharing. Um, I imagine that was frustrating waiting for over a decade for the rest of the community to kind of get on board with the impacts of trauma and the benefits of resiliency. So, yeah. Yep, yep, it was, and um, and at the same time, I I just had a sense of well, I'll I'll keep doing what I can do, and do the do the most I can. But it has been once the Aces material started coming out and the neurobiology research um, started to explode with the ability to do brain scans and and figure out what to do with the information coming in from that, then it's been really exciting um, to have it pick up so quickly with so many new modalities and so many skills where we can now say to our clients, not just other people have found this to be helpful, but if you do this, it will change how your brain works. It will help if you will do it. You just have to be willing to try. That's a whole different message for clients when asking yep. them to do something that they've never done before. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I think I am the last person from the leadership team that's on this call, but I'm just glancing down through here to make sure. If, they, if Crystal or what'd you say, did Marissa came Marissa in? Too. Okay, Marissa, um, are you where you can unmute? I don't know if you just sat down and need a minute, but we're talking about um, our role in the community and how we came to be doing this work and why we continue to do it. So if you're at a place where you feel like you can talk, do you mind to share that with us? Sure. Um, my name is Marissa Cornell, and I'm with the Mediation and Restorative Justice Center. Um, I think I got uh, I got recruited to help with the conference the first year um, was how I, I got involved with WCCI. And the trauma and resilience part of it gave a lot more context and direction to the work that we do at the Mediation Center. Um, We've been working kind of on um, d different types of diversion and the folks that usually get involved with the criminal justice system, I would say 90 to 95% of them, if not 100%, have a history of trauma and it connects with all of the other 
um, experiences in their lives and the, and the place that they landed as an adult. We also have juvenile programs. Um, and a lot of the kids are at risk youth um, or the referrals that we have. And, and so they have experienced trauma as well. And so what I have, what has continued to draw me to the work are two things. Um, one is that I've always been really interested in um, kind of organically developing community movements. And this, this process has just been an amazing thing to be part of, to, to be part of it and to watch it um, grow under Denise's leadership is that um, without any money or real resources, um, people just keep coming back to it, in, which says a lot about the work and the leadership and the um, importance of what we're doing here and how relevant it is to all of our work. So, so that's been really amazing to be part of. And also, um, just in the restorative justice, I've been involved in social justice and restorative justice work really since, um, since I was a teenager. Um, and what I've come to realize is that that restorative justice, a restorative work in itself isn't restorative unless it's trauma informed. That's what makes it restorative is when we come to um, the perspective of understanding what people have been through and what direction they're going in and what they're moving towards as much as what they're moving away from. So that's where that resilience comes in. Um, and it really has, re, has shifted the way that I think about the work that we do um, when we're trying to help people you know, behaviorally make different decisions in their lives. Um, what are they moving towards? Not what they teach you. <laughs> I have young kids. My kids went to Lucy Brock and one of the biggest gifts they ever gave us was to say, don't tell your child what not to do, tell them what to do. And so if we approach this with all of the folks that we're working with and, and our, our colleagues and ourselves that we're trying to do the right thing, not not do the wrong thing. Um, it really changes um, all of the work. And I think it's just, it's really um, influenced me personally and then also the work that I do. And so I'm, I'm so thankful to be part of it and, um, and to continue with the community movement, which is really the most amazing part. Awesome, Marissa, thank you. Um, I don't think there's any other leadership people, so I'll go ahead and somebody tell me if there is. Um, that's interesting that you said professionally and personally because um, I agree that it has it was a shift for me in both ways. So I'm Denise Prestall, um, the chair of WCCI, and I'm also on the events committee. And most of you know that this really came about because I was doing an internship to get my MSW after 20 years in practice because I just really wanted to change. And so I did it with um, Western Youth Network and Jennifer, and she said to me, I feel like this has been so, so, told so many times, have you heard about ACEs? And I honestly thought she meant a card game like spades, and I said no. And she said, well, that's what I want you to do here for your internship, I want you to bring that here. And she said, you need to talk to Crystal Kelly. And so I had Crystal come to a faith collaborative that I run, a faith school collaborative, and she did an hour long presentation. And every time I present or I'm in a room where people present, there is always at least one person that has a lightning bolt or a light bulb. And that was definitely me that day. And at first I really thought it was professional because I'll be honest in that I, after 20 years of working in a very small community, 10 of which I was the only school social worker in every school. I knew every family, I knew them for generations, and I had judgment about you know, why don't they just make different choices. And so um, to be able to learn that it actually, you know, trauma, childhood trauma actually changes the structure of your brain and the way your pathways work, it really immediately changed how I viewed um, my clients and the kids and and um, even teachers. And then I did it for a little while before, I, cause I knew I came from childhood trauma. I'd done therapy and I'd actually done it like three times and I thought I was fixed. And then I had kids of my own and all that stuff comes back. But the more trauma work I started doing, I actually resented doing an ACEs score on myself cause I knew it'd be so high. I didn't need to know what it was, and it wasn't until like a year ago when we did that together as WCCI that I actually had a number, and it was a nine. And in the moment that I knew, it changed me or personally. And so every time I watch the Nadine Burke Harris video where she says, we want to think this is them over there, but now I'm starting to realize it's all of us here. 
yeah, I started to realize that um, it wasn't just about how I view the people that I work with. It was also about how I viewed myself and my family and my children. And it really changed all that for me personally as well. So um, it's been a pretty And so that's how I got into it was, I, you know, you could say it was an accident. I feel like it's exactly where I was supposed to be at the time I was supposed to be there. But I continue to do it because I said this to some people yesterday. I have so recently been in the place where I was of the mindset that I was not safe. And to now be in such a different place just from hearing about ACEs and how it impacts you and that you can heal your brain, that it has become a mission um, that I continue to say that to people. And every time I do say it to people, share the information with them, it's a visible transformation that happens, um, especially if it's the first time somebody's ever heard about it. So definitely one of the, um, you know, if, if you believe in callings or missions or that kind of thing, I definitely feel like it's become my life's work for sure. And so, like Marissa said, I'm really proud to be a part of it. And um, it's not just the work that's amazing. It's also the actual group that's amazing and how we come from so many different places and disciplines and mindsets and ages. And, and we still all agree that this is an important thing and that this is what we want to be about. And without money, that we do it on a volunteer basis. So that's my why is just to continue to be able to spread the word that your brains can heal and you can choose different. And so I'm happy to be a part of this for sure. Do we have any other leadership people that came in? I don't think so. If we did just unmute yourself and jump in. So thanks all of you for sharing. I'm about that. And so now I want to talk just a little bit because when we've been talking to people about what are important to have in our conversations, we cannot obviously ignore the times that we're in with COVID and how we have gone from, you know, if the numbers are one in four kids in the classroom come from trauma or 60% of us have at least one, the past five to six months now, many of us who would have said we don't live in trauma have been under enormous amounts of stress in the very challenging times of quarantines and not being able to get you know the food that we need and being laid off and not being able to pay bills and being sick or being afraid of being sick so just wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge as the WCCI leadership team that um, we're aware of those things and that we want to be able to put some information about out about the ways that we cope with those types of things not that we're experts so I'm gonna start back at the top again. And um, if you don't mind to just say, you know, have things changed for you either personally or professionally? And then if you could maybe give us one way that you have learned that helps you cope with um, the stress and challenges of the past five or six months, um, we'll spend some time on that. And like I said, if you have any questions or comments, you're welcome to type those into the chat box. So Adam, if you're where you can unmute, um, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, so could you, could you state those one more time just so I, I can kind of get it in my head? Yes. So um, how have things changed for you professionally or personally, whichever you're comfortable sharing um, with the onset of the COVID stuff? And then one thing that you have learned that helps you cope with um, the challenges. Okay. Um, so on a personal level, um, I think we're, as you mentioned, we're all kind of struggling with what is going on in the world, what, you know, all the, the different things are going on uh, at the same time as COVID's going on. So trying to wrestle with everything that's going on in the world and uh, where our minds and, and thoughts go with that. It's been interesting to say the least. Um, but I will say, I think one of the things that's been really good for myself personally is our family, uh, becoming closer it seems like because we're around each other a lot more uh, where it's kind of forced upon us which uh, for some folks that can be a bad thing but for us it, it's been a really uh, good thing uh, in terms of uh, I have a daughter that's 11 starting middle school and so it's 
it's been a really good time for Shianata to do a lot of uh, bonding and, and build our relationship uh, that probably would not have happened without uh, COVID. Um, you know, uh, professionally, I can say that uh, being in public health, that it's been kind of wild to keep up with all of the differing facts and figures and everything that comes out. And also at the same time dealing with uh, days where it just struggles, the, the, the motivation struggles, all of those kind of things that I feel like many of us are going. Uh, and finding that work-life balance as well, I think has been uh, hard for me, uh, trying to work from home while also trying to balance uh, life outside of work has been challenging is another thing that I can mention. Um, for me, one of the, the things that I've been doing, um, I used to be a pretty competitive long distance runner and uh, being at home like this and living only a couple miles from the uh, beautiful palm trails and Bass Lake and all of those places, giving me a chance to get outdoors every day and, and really take in nature and, and, and pick back up the running that I love. Um, so my health's improved and, and all of those kind of things. Um, so that's been kind of a good thing that I've been able to do as well on a personal level. Okay, Adam, thank you for sharing. Uh, Candace, are you where you can unmute? She's coming, I think. Hi, sorry, it took me a minute. I'm still sitting outside and it's quite bright outside and I'm having a hard time seeing the screen whenever I'm looking at the at the Zoom. I've also been taking notes too, so. Um, so the question, I, Denise, was how's life changed yes. since we've been in, under this new COVID normal? Um, I think I agree a lot with Adam. Family closeness has improved um, when we're all we have. That's, it's um, forced us to like each other more, I think. Um, professionally. I've not been back in a school building very much since March until yesterday. So I don't know yet how that change is going to be, but my resilience and learning to wear my mask and to keep it on all the time is changing. Um, previous to that, I was just wearing it to go in the grocery store. So um, I'm looking forward to getting back on something of a regular schedule. I think that will be nice to do that. I feel like I'm rambling. I'm going to let somebody else talk. Um, one more thing, Candace, if you don't mind. Is there one thing that you can identify that's helped you cope with the challenges? Um, I think getting out and having a morning walk every day has been really important for me. Um, my kids notice if I don't. They say I'm grumpier if, if I didn't get it to go outside and have my morning walk. And now that the light has changed a little bit. It doesn't get bright quite so early and I have to get to school a little bit earlier. I'm not getting my morning walks outside. So that's one reason I'm out here soaking up some sun right now. But that's been real important for me. Okay, thank you, I appreciate it. Graham, are you where you can unmute? Yeah, I think for me the at least one of, if not the biggest challenges in this whole season affects personal and professional equally, which is the, the reality that things are changing so quickly on what feels like a weekly and maybe even daily basis. And I know that's something that we all are experiencing. So constantly having to make decisions and switch things in the personal realm and in the professional realm, and that has a, an emotional and mental burden to it for sure. Um, so we're, we're definitely navigating that in a lot of different ways. But I think one of the things that has helped me the most, again, in, in both those realms is, is just to have people that you can be completely honest and vulnerable with and where you can say all of this has gotten on top of me <laughs> because we're all we're all dealing with a lot. Certainly the COVID stuff, the racial justice conversations that are part of our context right now too, and a lot of other things. So we're, we're all dealing with a lot and we need to have those spaces and those people that we can say, I've just hit my limit, help me process through this. And, and I'm really grateful to have that in the staff here at, at the heart and to have it at home as well. And so it's 
we need that anyway, right? Regardless of COVID, we need those spaces. So hopefully that was true part of this and hopefully it'll be true on into the future, but I've definitely noticed the need for it. And then also what, what uh, Candace and Adam are saying, I, I resonate with at a deep level where we're blessed to have so many outdoor spaces that are just beautiful and remind us of simple things when life feels really complicated. So I'm, I'm outdoors a whole lot as well. Great, thank you, Graham. We appreciate that. And so Jennifer, are you where you can unmute? Uh, yeah, so you know, I'm one of those interesting people who, after I got into my routine, working from home actually works a little bit better for me, sort of. Um, I have been getting up at 5 a.m., which really stinks when the alarm goes off and that initial, like, get out of bed um, thing is challenging. But, you know, trying to work around my son, who will be four um, soon, has been interesting. Um, you know, not having child care and trying to work full time is a challenge, but I'm grateful, like a lot of people have said, for this additional time with family. And this time before my son starts school, you know, I'll never get that back. So I've just been, like, amazingly blessed to have this this random opportunity that I never expected to spend more time with him. And so I'm just really living in a lot of gratitude for that. And then I live like way out in the middle of nowhere. And so it's at least a 20 minute commute for me into work. And so when I don't have to commute here yonder and everywhere, I've been able to get a lot more things done. And I think like without that daily, like kind of office responsibility, I've been able to be a little bit more efficient too. So it took me a while to find my groove, but now I'm in it and I'm kind of loving it. And, um, you know, I think one of the things that I had to realize early on was just to give myself a lot of grace. Like there would be some days where I would work three hours and I would just have to be like, well, that's as good as you could do today. You're just going to have to move on and let it go. Um, so, you know, giving myself a lot of grace and I think also trying to figure out some at-home workout things. Um, if you not for heard of this. I hadn't heard of this, but somebody gave me this tip that there are these under the desk um, cycling things, um, bicycles, and I purchased one of those. And so I can like cycle while I do meetings and there are like in-home Pilates things. And so I've been very excited to be able to like work in some exercise because like Candace, I am a much happier and less grumpy person if I'm working out. So that's how I've been coping. Very cool. We have kids with those cycle things under their desk. So I'm glad that you heard about that and that was helpful for you. Life-changing. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Uh, Marissa? So um, I, I ha have an interesting contrast in my house because I feel like, I feel like everything has changed um, and in professionally and personally, just in my ability to um, meet the needs of my staff and my clients. Um, we've had, there was a lot of fear that we weren't going to be able to do that. And it's really showcased the resiliency of, um, of the folks that we work with. Um, it's at the same time, more, our resources are more accessible and less accessible, depending on, I guess, um, where you're situated. If you're already involved, then we've been able to um, continue making sure that people have their needs met. But I think it's harder to reach new folks um, who weren't already engaged. Um, my husband is considered essential and has continued to go to work every day, just like he did before. And I feel like there's a really big contrast there of that I, I've got the kids at home with me and I'm trying to figure out this balance and how do I meet all these people's needs um, and, and do it from home. And, and he just gets up and goes to work every day like he always has. Um, and so it's, it's interesting um, to see, to have both of those kind of realities in one place. Um, so. I also feel like it's established some common ground, um, not that there wasn't common ground, but that I'm, I'm finding when I'm talking with folks, colleagues and folks that I'm working with as a, you know, case manager or whatever the service is that they're telling me things, they're going through the same thing that I am. They're figuring out how to um, meet their kids needs and figure out what school looks like while they're also having to work and go to appointments and do all the things. Um, and so, so it's, we, it's brought us all to the kind of the same place and we're facing a lot of the same things together, um, which I, I think is, a, is, is helpful, a helpful reminder um, that there is a lot of common ground and we're all humans dealing with this pandemic among other things. Um, one of the things that we have done in my household is I'm an expressive arts person. And so we um, like to make things. My youngest is five and he likes to build things and I just give him random stuff and he goes in the yard and builds things. My daughter likes to bake and make crafts and I like to make herbal stuff and 
uh, forage things out of the yard. And so there's been more time to do that. And I've realized that that's really fulfilling to me and to us and that we need to do it more. Um, so I think it's been finding the things that are, um, her, that bring a lot of joy and, and making sure that those stay in, in our lives, no matter what happens going forward. Great, Marissa, thank you for sharing. And I think Stephanie stepped away, but it's back now. Stephanie, are you where you can talk? Yes, yep, I'm back now. So yeah, um, let's see, with COVID, I'm trying to think, we're, we're back here in the office now. And so it, it hasn't been that different here lately for a while it was, because we worked from home quite a bit. Um, the office is a lot quieter than usual. It's a, it's a little lonely, so that's definitely different. I've realized that I, I do a lot better with people around. It kind of helps me focus, so there's been a bit of an adjustment. I think right now, I mean, for everybody, just with, um, with COVID and with uh, the racial tensions and with everything that's been happening, there's, you know, there's so much going on. And there's so many, um, I think, anxiety provoking things as well, just things to worry about right now. And I know a lot of people are dealing with that. Um, I think for me personally, like faith has helped me a lot just to know that um, I have faith that this definitely isn't the end of the story and that the end of the story is going to be a lot better than the part that we're in now. Um, and also, I think just getting outside as much as I can has really, really been great. And being that that's something that we still can do despite COVID. Um, just doing a lot of mountain biking and kind of taking up something something new to be interested in and something that I can kind of engage in has been has been really great. Um, and also just keeping close contact with my loved ones, even by phone, has been really important. Okay, thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, so is that the last leadership person, I think? I think, so not jump in. Um, so for me, whoever said everything's changed, everything has changed. Um, I think one of the biggest things for me is that my home was like my sanctuary. It was where I got all my healing and centeredness and where I was tethered. And I do three or four jobs. And so when I first heard I was going home, I was like, this is a party, like, let's go home. And I wore my snowman pajamas and I just thought it was gonna be fantastic. And I realized, I don't know, it took about three months because I'm used to having a summer break. So I'm good for a couple months. And then it took about three months for me to realize now all the stuff was at home with me. And so I had, I was, not as good about compartmentalizing and stopping things at a certain time. Everything just seemed like it went on all the time. So I actually was a little bit um, glad to come back to school yesterday because I thought things will be more compartmentalized for me. So that was an interesting experience. Another very interesting experience was um, I did not have a good school experience all the way, K-12 and into college. And I've always thought of teachers as kind of, I think like we think of parents when we're young, like these superheroes, they can do no wrong kind of people, even though I knew that they could. And so when this all fell apart in the spring, a lot of the teachers fell apart with it and they were very anxious and upset and distressed and uncomfortable. And, and we, I realized quickly, we talk about three prongs in the schools that is, um, the Compassionate Schools Project, trauma and resiliency, awareness and knowledge, self-care, the critical ethical need for self-care and practical strategies. And so what I realized very quickly is that the teachers had the kids. They were so worried about them and had so many plans to how to make sure they were okay, but the teachers really needed um, support and understanding and debriefing. And so the student services team at my school took a day, three days a week to meet with teachers like this to say, you know, what's going on and just to hear, you know, that these were actually people who couldn't sleep and who were anxious and who had upset stomachs and who were having bad dreams and um, that they were dealing with the impacts of trauma just like everybody else and um, that they needed support. And so that's really changed the way I think about not just compassionate schools, but the community as a whole, is that 
that usually kids have somebody taking care of them. We have so many fantastic agencies and whether it's teachers or Western Youth Network or Daymark or DSS, that it's often the service providers or the teachers or the people doing the work that don't really have what they need. And so that's, that was a huge lesson for me that I hope that I don't let go of. It's just making sure that we as grownups have what we need as well. So those were the big changes for me if I had to just think too. And the coping skills, I think I learned to relax. Um, if you know me, you know I burn the candle at both ends, always doing 55 things at once. Pro productivity, you know, is, is my identity. And I realized after about a month at home that I carried everything in my chest. And if you, you probably don't know this, but last summer I was diagnosed with like three major medical conditions at once. And I was like, oh, trauma does have a lifetime adult health impact. That's interesting. And so um, to be at home where I really, you cannot be on a Zoom meeting and be doing emails and talking on the phone and writing a note to the person at the door and parenting and texting, you really just have to be on a Zoom call. So I think it was the first time in my adult life that I really had to do one thing at a time. So it forced me to slow down and I finally got that tightness in my chest gone after a couple of months. I really don't want it to come back. So that's the thing I think that I um, have learned to do is just accept that whatever I've done today is enough for today. And it's okay not to accomplish 150 things that we just getting through the day at this point in our lives is enough and um, to kind of lower my standards for myself and just be okay with doing whatever it is that I'm doing. So um, that's my coping skills to relax my standards a little bit. So um, thanks to everybody for all the thoughts we've shared. We've got like seven minutes and um, I'm interested if anybody from the audience has a thought or a question, something they'd like to share. Um, we can continue talking. We all have plenty to say. So we can continue talking until one or we are happy to take thoughts and comments from the people who are listening. So I'm gonna be quiet just for a minute and let you see. You're also welcome to unmute. Now that we're done talking, if you'd like to unmute and say something, we'd love to hear from you, um, either about what you've heard today or upcoming um, things. So I'm just gonna give us a minute of silence where somebody can chime in if they'd like to. Now, okay, anybody from the leadership team like to circle back around and touch on something that somebody else said or a thought that you had while you were talking, I'll give you a, an opportunity to do that. I was just thinking that I really agree with what you were saying, Denise, about kind of relaxing the standards. And it, it's been a big deal with me too, to kind of just, um, I think it's important that we are, kind of, um, you know, a little easier on ourselves. Now that's been a good skill for me as well. Dr. Elliott put, usually in the schools, on the first day of school, the entire school system is required to go to the high school and have what we call convocation. And there's speeches and so forth and so on. And so yesterday it was a video and he was talking, you know, all the things that you would expect him to say, but when we're talking about gratitude, one of the things that I'm grateful for is that I'm employed by a system who is taking trauma and compassion and resiliency seriously and putting it their language. And so he was talking and I was actually doing some other things while I was listening to him talk. And then I heard him talking about, um, you know, that the number one concerns that we should have is the safety of our children, the well-being of our children, and that he expects grace and compassion from us, not just towards the kids, but towards each other. And I, that's, I don't know about you or where you've worked, but when I first came into this system, that was not the expectation. So, um, you know, just not only the, is it okay to relax our standard, but that it can be the expectation that we give not only each other grace, but ourselves as well. So it's a really cool time to be um, doing what we're doing in the community where it's happening. And I'm 
I'm grateful for that. Speaking of gratitude, when each of you are talking about how happy you are to be home with your family, and I'm happy to be at home with my family too. My family is some of my favorite people. But what I have found the way my mind works during this thing is everything that I'm grateful for, I think about all the people who don't have that. And so um, we went to the beach this summer with, we brought someone that wasn't a part of our family and the first three days I, I either wanted to go home or never go back to the beach. And so I thought, you know, th and then my daughter actually went on a trip with a family who, um, and she had to come home early because of the, the amount of hostility and aggression in that family. So even though I've been very happy to be home with my family, I think about the family that I come from and all the other types of families in the world and how, and here locally and how not everybody is having that current experience. And so to be locked in, you know, used to you could go to school or go to work and get away from your abuser and to be locked in with that person and not ever able to leave has to feel pretty hopeless. And so I'm thankful to work, but not everybody can. I'm thankful to be able to work from home, but not everybody can. And so definitely has given me the perspective of the things that I'm grateful for that are not, all, not everybody has. So other thoughts from leadership team or anybody else? We got about 60 seconds. I really like Denise when I think the phrase you used was, was some you used was something like the ethical consideration of self care. Mm -hmm. And that, that puts a little bit of language to something that I've been wrestling with because it's not just self care for self care's sake. It is that it is about us being healthy as individuals for sure. But there's also that professional aspect to it where unless we care for ourselves well, we're not going to be able to serve our community in a way that benefits them. We're going to operate out of an unhealthy place and that will undoubtedly come out on, on those that we're serving. And so just that language of there is an ethical aspect of this. And I don't even know if that's exactly what it means. I want to ask you more about that, but that's kind of how it hit me. And, and again, I've just been wrestling with that. Like the, the way I care for myself directly impacts the way I care for other people. So there's, yeah, that was helpful for me. I'm glad that comes out of the curriculum that we use to train the whole county on compassionate schools. And you have to use that language with teachers, but all adults. I was the same way. Who has time to take a bubble bath or read a book or sit down for a minute? Um, and you have to describe it in terms of it's an ethical responsibility to take care of yourself so that you can be your best for the people that you're interacting with. And so we've tried to change the way we think of that so it's not a luxury it's a necessity and they oh, yeah. people seem to respond to that better i love that I, i've done some of that kind of work in the humanitarian context and those people are also notoriously terrible at, at self-care because they think they have to be the tough people who help everybody else and so yeah I, I think framing it that way is huge for a lot of different contexts i love that so we'll give credit to Washington State for that. Um, so it's one o'clock. We're going to let you go. We know you all have busy schedules. We're going to be here every Wednesday at noon. Um, the schedule is on our website, watagaccci.org. We got a lot of really cool stuff coming up in upcoming sessions. So thank you for spending an hour with us. Uh, we hope that you have a good rest of the day and rest of the week. And we look forward to talking to you again soon. Have a good day, everybody. Thanks, Denise. Call Candace. Which one? Calling now. Hey there. So I uh, just need an adult to talk me through this. First of all, that was fantastic. That's good. I always dread things like that. And then when it actually happens, it's fine. Um, so now I'm trying to figure out, and I know you may not know this, but I was just hoping to have an adult to talk it through. I see where it says recording. Wonder how to get that somewhere else. So it's got, uh, You've got something that says it's the recording of this particular day. That's what it looks like in the top left hand, because I've stopped recording. Mm -hmm. 
So it doesn't mean, but in the top left-hand corner, it says recording, which I feel, I feel like means it's the recording that we just did. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I've never done a recording on Zoom. I okay. tried to keep it and do something with it. So uh, here are my two suggestions. Um, Haley might know. Who's Haley? Might, not Haley. Right? Who's our intern that works for WCCI? Oh, yeah, Haley. Okay. Yeah. So she might know okay. exactly what to do with it. Or you could um, search on YouTube and see if there's a YouTube video that explains how to take a recording from Zoom and upload it somewhere else. Both very good ideas. I was supposed to meet with Haley today and we changed our appointment, but I'll text her and see if she's available. So thank you for your help. I appreciate you very sure. much. And Sorry I guess for my microphone so far. Oh no, it's it was kind of <laughs> funny. Whenever you do something like that, I'm like, see, Candace is not perfect after all. <laughs> Definitely not. No. All right, I'm gonna track down somebody that can help me and I'll you're gonna be on WCCI call in the morning. I have something scheduled with Green Valley with Student Services to talk about teaching resiliency skills to the middle schoolers. Cool. All right. Well, then Sandra I was. said she was going to keep it at that time. I said, okay. Well, that was scheduled before we changed WCCI. So I guess I'm in. Okay. So I'll see you on Friday then. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.